Biotech, biotechnology. This is a really interesting chapter. Um, it's growing every day. Uh, and our textbook, it wasn't published that long ago, but our textbook has pretty, um, what they consider old technology <laughs> mentioned in there, because this area is growing every day. It's growing and expanding every day. So, but it's a very interesting topic. It's a very interesting uh, chapter. So what is biotechnology? It's basically genetic engineering. It's where scientists are manipulating DNA. Um, and what this chapter is all about is the tools. Okay, we're going to be learning about some of the tools that scientists use for genetic engineering or genetic manipulation. Okay, so the first tool that uh, we're going to be discussing is PCR. PCR. And PCR is um, polymerase chain reaction. Uh, in this reaction, we're making billions of copies of DNA. Okay, uh, and this is a very practical use. It's used in many laboratories that study DNA. It's used, uh, we'll be talking about the many applications of biotechnology, but one of them would be for forensics. And forensics is a really interesting topic. Um, and when you go to a police station, they're going to have a forensics lab. And one of the machines that they're going to have in the forensics lab is a thermocycler, which does polymerase chain reaction. All you need is a sample piece of DNA, maybe from a crime scene, okay? Uh, all you need is one small or a small sample of DNA from a crime scene, and then you um, put the DNA in the machine, the thermocycler, along with some of the materials, and you're gonna end up with multiple, multiple copies of DNA, billions of copies of DNA within hours, okay? So all you really need um, is the target DNA sequence from the crime scene. You're gonna need the DNA polymerase, you're gonna need primers, and then on this side, which is kind of blocked off, are the nucleotides. You have the adenines, the thymines, the guanines, and the cytosines, okay? So you need um, one, two, three, three starting materials, okay? And then the machine itself is going to, it's called a thermocycler because it's going to heat up the DNA and then it's going to cool down the DNA. And then it's going to heat up the DNA and cool down the DNA. It does this for many, many cycles uh, for hours and you end up with many copies of DNA. And this is how it, um, this is how it works, okay? These are the materials that you need, as I stated. You need a template, you need the DNA polymerase, and then you need the nucleotides, and then you need the primer. And you put them in the little thermocycler machine they're pretty small, they can just fit on a small desk, okay? And within hours, you're gonna get many copies of DNA. Here's a video of it, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna um, show a YouTube video in my YouTube video, okay? That's kind of meta, all right? But I'm not gonna be um, showing you a video within a video. We're gonna do that in class, so we're gonna move on to the next slide, talking about PCR. So what do you need to do? What happens in the, in the PCR? Um, process. Well, like I said, the machine, it heats up the DNA and then it cools down the DNA. Okay, so step one is to denature the DNA. It's going to heat it up. Okay, it's going to heat it up to almost boiling point, 90 degrees Celsius. And when you heat up the DNA, it breaks the hydrogen bonds that hold the DNA together. Okay, so here's our DNA strands held together by hydrogen bonds. When you heat it up, the two strands are going to separate. The hydrogen bonds between the nitrogenous bases break, and you're gonna end up with two strands of DNA that are gonna act as templates, okay? They're gonna act as templates, and then the primers are gonna to attach to, um, um, to the templates, and then DNA polymerase is gonna start adding new nucleotides to the complementary strand, okay? So you're, and this is all happening. Number one, it starts off with denaturing in the thermocycler. It's gonna heat up the DNA, and then cooling down is what we call annealing. So you cool it down so that the primers can attach and DNA polymerase can start adding complementary nucleotides to the templates. And that is also um, annealing is um, cooling down, and then the DNA polymerase is extending the new strands of DNA. That's extension, okay? So, um, oh, also, uh, Fillmore has, you know, brought up here, you know, what does 90 degrees Celsius do to our DNA polymerase? When you heat up the DNA to separate, 
the two strands of DNA, we have to, we, we're going to use DNA polymerase to add new um, complementary nucleotides. But DNA polymerase is an enzyme, right? It's a protein. And what happens when we heat up enzymes, when we heat up proteins? Do you guys remember? Remember when we heat up proteins or enzymes, uh, they denature, okay? They denature. And so when we heat up, when the thermocycler heats up the DNA to 90 degrees Celsius, it would denature our DNA polymerase, okay? Our DNA polymerase would not be able to do its job, which is to extend the complementary DNA strands. So we have to use a different DNA polymerase from a different organism, not from our cells, right? Because our body temperature is around 37 degrees Celsius, comparing that to 90 degrees Celsius. Uh, 90 degrees Celsius is too hot. It would definitely denature our DNA polymerase. So we're going to use DNA polymerase from another organism, another organism um, from hot spring bacteria called Thermus aquaticus. Okay, that sounds really cool, huh? So their DNA polymerase is called TAC polymerase, okay? So this is a type of DNA polymerase from a different organism that we use in PCR, okay? So in PCR, we're gonna use a different DNA polymerase. It's from a different organism that lives in hot springs. So here's a photo. I think um, Miss Brown took this photo uh, many years ago from Yellowstone. At Yellowstone National Park, you're gonna find geysers. And in the geysers, you're gonna find some really cool um, uh, gradients of colors because you're going to have different um, bacteria, bacterial uh, colonies growing along the, the geysers. Okay, so yeah, bacteria mat. You can see here this orangey um, substance that's a bacterial mat where there are trillions, more than trillions, of bacteria just growing there. Okay, they're reproducing. They can survive in really hot, hot. Um, conditions. They're adapted to these hot conditions. And so what we do is we take their DNA polymerase called TAC polymerase and we use it for PCR. Okay. All right. Um, the next tool that we're going to be talking about. So PCR is the first tool. The second tool is DNA sequencing. Um, back when I was in college, uh, at the end of my college years, they had just sequenced the human genome and it was huge news, right? It took, I think, 13 years for scientists to, um, to sequence the human genome. Um, and now it's come so, so far with DNA sequencing. We can DNA sequence an organism's genome in hours now. So we went from like decades to hours. So the technology for DNA sequ sequencing has come very, very far. Okay. So recently, um, we've sequenced two extinct ne uh, species like Neanderthals. So we've, we've been able to gather their DNA and gather the DNA of woolly mammoths. And so we have their entire genome. Okay? Advances, in, advances in sequencing techniques make genome sequencing increasingly faster and less expensive. And like I said, within a matter of hours now. It's pretty amazing. You know, back in the um, 1970s, there was a scientist named Frederick Sanger, and he was the first guy to come up with a really um, excellent method of sequencing, and it's called the dideoxy sequencing method. This method is used, it's still used today, but it's really, um, it takes a long time, um, and so it's really only used for small scale sequencing jobs, like um, small batch sequencing, okay? And so what made his um, experiment really unique is that he used dideoxynucleotides, the DDATP, DDCTP, DDTTP, and DDGTP. You know, these nucleotides, remember uh, nucleotides, when you look at the sugars, um, you have the phosphate group and then you have the nitrogenous base. These um, nucleotides are actually missing the um, the um, hydroxyl group attached to carbon number three and so they are unable to form a bond with another nucleotide okay so you know how we said we, we say like this is the five prime end this is the three prime end and DNA polymerase can only add to the three prime end because it's missing that OH functional group at that carbon number three when this nucleotide is added to a growing DNA strand, it stops. There's, it's, the DNA strand doesn't get any longer. There's no elongation. It just stops, okay? 
So what he did was he had a template that he wanted to sequence and he would add these um, dideoxynucleotides and he would end up with multiple fragments of DNA where they end up, um, like a fragment of DNA where they end up, it told him where an adenine, you know, where an adenine would be, which is complementary to that T. You guys see that there? This adenine is complementary to that T. So um, he would add all the adenines into one test tube with the template, and then he would end up with all these different lengths of DNA wherever there was an adenine that was complementary to that T. Okay, and then he did that for cytosine, he did that for thymine, he did that for guanine, and so he would end up with all these fragments of DNA, and then we're going to be talking about gel electrophoresis um, in this uh, video, but gel electrophoresis basically it separates DNA strands according to size, um, and so the shorter pieces of DNA are going to travel the farthest, Okay, because they can, they're so small that they can travel the farthest, and then the largest size DNA fragments are gonna are gonna lag behind because they're so big. Okay, and so they were able to, he was able to sequence DNA based on the different fragments of DNA that was um, created. Okay, uh, so like here, if you know, if in the in the cytosine tube really short fragment that told him that oh okay there is a c here and then the next shortest fragment is a g okay the next short fragment is an a okay and this would be complementary to the template so they were able to sequence so you can see here it would take a really long time to sequence dna using the sanger method the dideoxynucleotide method okay now we have next generation sequencing and there's um I looked this up the other night, but there are many different kinds of next generation sequencing. The one that's uh, mentioned in your textbook um, is called pyro, uh, pyrophosphate sequencing, okay, where it's uh, a light is going to um, be emitted from nucleotides when they are joined to a growing strand, okay? But this is much faster, 70 to 90 million nucleotides in an, uh, in an hour, okay? And there's a video here which we'll go over in class, but we're not gonna go over in this video. So the next generation one that I wanted to include, uh, that's included in your textbook and also in, um, uh, in the notes and in this PowerPoint is called Pyro, Pyrophosphate sequencing, okay? And we'll talk about why in just a minute. But basically, uh, what you do is if you want to sequence the DNA of a cell, you take the DNA and you cut it up into little pieces. And we're going to be talking about how you do that, okay, uh, later on in this chapter. But basically, you cut up the genome, you cut it up into little small fragments, and then you take each fragment and you put it, um, you put it in a little well. Okay, you put it in a little well. So this is like this is a well. These are um, it's a tray with lots of little wells. You put a lot of, um, you put that single fragment that uh, in a well with a bead. Okay, and then using PCR, you're going to end up with a million copies of that same fragment. So you're going to end up with a million copies of the same DNA fragment and they're gonna be attached to the bead. They're gonna be extending from the bead, okay? And then the machine that does the pyrophosphate sequencing is gonna be adding nucleotides one at a time. So we'll start with adenine. So it adds adenine um, to that well, and then, and then it's gonna wash the well, and then the next one is gonna, they're gonna add thymine, and they're gonna wash it. And then they're going to add guanine, they're going to wash it, and then they're going to add cytosine, and they're going to wash it. Okay? So what's going on here? Like, why do this? Why add nucleotides one at a time and then wash it? Um, this is another video, which we'll go over in class. But basically, oops, let me go back. Okay? Basically, what's happening here, okay, is when you add the adenine, okay, to the well, which has the beads containing millions of the same fragment of DNA, um, here is the template strand of DNA, and then um, the DNA polymerase is adding new nucleotides to our growing strand. And every time it adds the adenine, 
Okay, see this right here? Every time it adds the adenine or the DATP, um, two phosphate groups come out. Okay, and when those two phosphate groups come out, that's what's called a pyrophosphate. So pyrophosphate, um, pyrophosphate is basically the two phosphate groups. Okay, that's the two phosphate groups. And those two phosphate groups are going to actually go through a chemical reaction with um, a specific enzyme that's also added to the well. There's an enzyme called luciferase. I know it sounds kind of weird. Luciferase and luciferase is um, the enzyme that's found in um, lightning bugs, you know, uh, bugs that light up. And so what happens is that when the pyrophosphate comes off of that nucleotide, as that nucleotide um, is added to our growing strand, and there's going to be light emitted. Light's going to be emitted because there's a chemical reaction with um, luciferase. Okay, um, and so the scientists so they add the adenines and then they wash it. Okay, they wash it. Oh, by the way, when it emits light, um, the light is recorded by a computer program. Okay, so the computers do all of this. Um, humans are not just like sitting there like w looking for a flash of light and recording it. Um, a computer does the whole thing. A machine does the whole thing. Okay, and then after the adenines, and they're gonna add, they, they're gonna turn on the phosphate for thymine, and they add the thymine. If there's no flash of light, that means that the next, um, the next nucleotide is not complementary. That thymine is not complementary to the next nucleotide. Okay, so see here when they add the thymine, thymine is not complementary to guanine, so there's no flash of light. Okay, and then they're gonna add the guanine next. Okay, and then. Um, Guanine is not complementary to guanine, so there's no flash of light. And then they rinse out the well. Oh, and then they add the cytosine. I forgot that. They add the cytosine, which is comp complementary to that uh, G, okay? And so there's going to be a flash of light. So you saw a flash of light when adenine was added, and then you didn't see a flash of light when thymine and guanine was added, but then you saw another flash of light after cytosine was added. So this is telling the computer program that the sequence is A, C, and then they do the whole thing over again. They're gonna turn on the faucet for adenine, they're gonna turn on the faucet for thymine, they're gonna turn on the faucet for guanine and cytosine. Each time um, they're rinsing it out and each time the computer is looking out for a flash of light, okay? So it, the pattern of flashes reveals the sequence. Okay, so, oh, so here is a picture of the, um, the flash of light. Like, how does that happen? Okay, so here's that, um, that thymine, the TTP, okay, the TTP. It gets added by the DNA polymerase, and then the two phosphate groups, two phosphate groups, pyrophosphate, um, it's going to turn into ATP using another enzyme called uh, sulfurylase. Okay, ATP with another enzyme called luciferase is going to release a flash of light. Okay, and you guys don't need to know this chemical reaction. Just know that every time in the pyrophosphate sequencing method, the next generation sequencing method, um, there's going to be a flash of light every time a nucleotide is complementary to the template is added to the growing strand. And then the computer uh, program will generate this um, image, okay? And I think this one is a little bit better here. You can see um, the flashes of light correlate with the, um, the nucleotide that's added. So you can see that the first one is T, second flash of light came from C, next one flash of light came from A, right and then the next one is G right and so oh actually you know I skipped the ones in between okay there are um, gonna be little flashes of light okay but yeah you can see like this is a fragment of DNA TT and the reason why it's gonna be they know it's a TT right after each other is because see how high or how tall this line is okay and on the uh, y-axis it um, it correlates with the number of nucleotides in the sequence. So it's T, it's two T's in a row, and then the C, and then the um, the T's. Oh, okay, so the, actually the little ones don't really, yeah, the little ones don't count. Okay, it's probably too little. It doesn't count as a nucleotide. Okay, so um, it's, you know, the ones that are as tall as, that correlate with number one, that is a nucleotide, and then you can have um, two in a row, and then you can have 
four in a row, okay? So over here, that means that there were four guanines in a row, okay? So this is what the computer does for the next generation sequencing. Um, specifically, this is called pyrophosphate sequencing. But you guys, there are, other, there are other kinds of next generation sequencing techniques. I know that there's one called ion sequencing, where they, um, when a nucleotide is added to the growing strand, a hydrogen ion is released and it increases the pH of the solution. And when it increases the pH of the solution, a computer uh, or actually pH detector um, will record um, will record the sequence. Okay, it's amazing. It's so it's so complicated. But it's amazing what scientists can do. All right, and then uh, before we continue and talk about the other tools that's used in biotechnology, we do need to talk about bacteria because bacteria is used in a lot in a lot of biotechnology tools. Okay, so as a review, remember bacteria are unicellular prokaryotes, meaning they're single cell, and they do not reproduce by uh, mitosis, they reproduce by binary fission, okay, binary fission. And they can grow very rapidly, you know, they can um, double their numbers in 20 minutes, right? Their life cycle is very short, only like 20 minutes. So you can get like 100 million bacteria overnight, starting with just one. Okay, and they are found all over the earth. Okay, they're a dominant form of life on earth, earth, and they're incredibly diverse. There's so many strains of bacteria. Okay, we don't really say species of bacteria, we usually say strains, which is equivalent to um, species. Okay, and also we need to talk about the genome of uh, bacteria. So, when you look at the genetic material inside of bacteria, they have a single circular chromosome. So because it's just one chromosome, they're haploid. They are not diploid. They do not reproduce sexually. They reproduce asexually, right? And their DNA is naked, meaning that when you look at their DNA in the cell, there's no histone proteins that the DNA is wrapped around. There's also no introns, okay? So every nucleotide in the genome counts. It counts for, maybe it's going to um, code for uh, a protein, okay? And they have about 4 million base pairs. Uh, when you compare that to us, we have 3 billion base pairs, okay? So their genome is a lot smaller. Even though it's a lot smaller, every nucleotide counts, okay? So it's about 4,300 genes, um, about 1 in a 1,000 of what DNA... Um, they have, you know, the amount of DNA is very small compared to eukaryotes. <coughs> So, you know, if they're so simple, if they're so simple, how have they gotten to be so diverse? Okay, if you think about it, you know, if all of their nucleotides count for a protein, if there was a mutation in one of the nucleotides in the DNA, that you're going to get a new um, species or strain of bacteria, okay? So if there's going to be a change in the DNA, it's going to lead to a new strain, okay? So there are a few ways that DNA, um, there are a few ways that bacteria can evolve and change over time. There's something called vertical evolution, where you have um, you have a bacteria and it duplicates. Okay, it divides. It divides into one that is just like it. This is the clone, right? And then maybe there's a mutation in the other cell. Okay, so this would be a new. Okay, a new strain, oops, I meant to say strain there, okay, a new strain due to a mutation on the genome. Okay, it's a different, it's a different species, or a different strain, I should say. And then there's horizontal evolution. Bacteria can do conjugation, okay, conjugation is when they form a conjugation bridge. Their cell membrane, their cell membranes are connected, and there's a bridge where they can literally exchange DNA information. Um, and the DNA information that they do exchange is uh, in the form of a plasmid. And we'll be talking about plasmids in just a minute. Here's their chromosome. This is their chromosome. But they do have extra DNA inside of their cytoplasm called plasmids. They're small circular pieces of DNA that actually code for other things. Okay? And so the plasmid can make a copy of itself and then send that plasmid over to the recipient cell. This is actually how... Um, some bacteria can gain antibiotic resistance if a plasmid, let's say that this 
uh, bacteria here has on the plasmid maybe a gene that is going to make it um, uh, resistant to an antibiotic, a specific antibiotic. Well, that plasmid could be duplicated, a copy of it can be made, and then it gets sent over to the recipient cell, which now has a copy of that antibiotic resistance gene. Okay, this is by conjugation or horizontal evolution. And then there's also something called transduction. Transduction is where bacteria can gain, um, they can gain new genes via a virus, okay, via a virus. So um, here's a phage, a bacteria phage that infects the bacteria. Um, and let's say that, you know, um, Oh, you know, we didn't really talk about like the, the life cycle of the bacteria, E. coli or phages, but what's going to happen here is instead of the bacteria, you know, um, uh, dying in this case, okay, the phage DNA is going to incorporate, become part of the, um, the bacterial DNA or genome. And then when that bacteria, you know, divides, it's actually dividing and copying the phage DNA. And then sometimes you know, um, the phage is going to end up killing the bacteria, and when the bacteria explodes, so you can see right here um, in this picture, when the bacteria explodes, um, <laughs> some of the DNA can be taken up by other uh, bacteria. Okay, so this is another way, transformation. So here we have a donor DNA, or this guy, this bacteria is exploding, it's dying, and then there's extra DNA outside of the recipient, and Bacteria able to be transformed. Remember we did talk about that with Griffith's experiment, right? Bacteria can be transformed. They can be genetically changed. They can easily take up uh, DNA that's in their surroundings, okay? So these are the four ways that DNA or bacteria can actually evolve, okay? Vertical, horizontal, and then transduction where they gain new genes via a virus, and then transformation is where they just take up um, DNA from their environment that came from a donor. So let's talk about plasmids. I did say that plasmids are extra pieces of DNA that's found in um, bacteria. They are usually about 5,000 to 20,000 base pairs, so they are smaller than the chromosome. Okay, They're self-replicating, they carry extra genes, anywhere between two to three, and oftentimes those genes are for the antibiotic resistance genes, okay? And they can be exchanged between bacteria horizontal transfer. Remember that's conjugation, remember here? Horizontal transfer is over here um, by conjugation. They form a conjugation bridge, and the plasmids can just cross over the bridge. Um, and so when they are exchanged, it can cause um, bacteria to be you know, rapidly changing and they can be uh, evolving. So like, for example, if a bacteria gets a antibiotic resistance plasmid, it can now survive. It can now survive um, the treatment of antibiotics and then it can reproduce. And that's evolution, right? Being able to survive and being able to reproduce. And so um, these plasmids can be transferred by conjugation, but also they can be imported from the environment as well. That's transformation. Okay, um, so mutation, right, can cause um, bacteria to become different, evolve differently. That's vertical gene transfer. And then horizontal transfers, they're going to form a conjugational bridge, right? They form a bridge. And then the plasma can be copied and then it can transfer over. Okay. So, why are we talking about, you know, plasmids? Plasmids. Um, are useful for us because we can actually use them um, as a way to transfer genes into a bacteria. Okay, so it's a way to get genes into bacteria very easily. And I did, you know, mention before in class how like we can have bacteria make human proteins for us. So how do we get the human protein into the bacteria? We're going to use a plasmid. Okay. So what scientists have done is they'll take plasmids out of the bacteria, they'll take plasmids out of the bacteria, they'll cut the plasmid open. It's sort of like, you know, th let's say that this is a, um, like a rubber band that's circular. You cut the rubber band somewhere and you now have a piece of string, a piece of DNA that's open and you can insert maybe the, a human gene, okay, maybe for insulin, into the plasmid and then glue it together. 
Okay, so now you have a plasmid with the human gene in there, and we call this a vector because that plasmid can go inside. It's gonna go inside of the bacteria, and now the bacteria has the human genes in it, okay? Do you guys see that? It looks like a face there, doesn't it? So the, the plasmids um, are used as a vector. They're going to go inside of the bacteria and they're gonna take the human gene inside, okay? So we can get these bacteria to start making human proteins for us. Plasmids are used to insert new genes into bacteria, okay? Like, so, for example, looking at, like, the human, maybe the human genome, and then we find a gene that we want the bacteria to have. So let's say that this is the insulin gene, okay? Let's say this is the insulin gene. We're going to cut it. We're going to cut it out of a human cell. We're going to cut it out of the human genome. So there's our insulin gene, and we're going to insert it into the plasmid. And we have to actually cut the plasmid using the same, what we call, we're gonna be talking about in just a minute, using the same restriction enzyme, okay? Restriction enzymes are those scissors. The restriction enzymes are the enzymes that are gonna cut the DNA at a specific place. It's gonna cut the plasmid at a specific place, okay? And those, those ends, see these ends? They have to like match up together, okay? They have to match up together. And then now the human gene is in there. Oh, we gotta use ligase, okay? Ligase is gonna like glue the ends together. And now we have what we call recombinant plasmid, okay? We now have a recombinant plasmid, uh, and it makes sense why it's called recombinant because we're recombining, right? We, we are um, recombining um, DNA, DNA from human and DNA from a bacteria, and we're mixing it together, we're recombining it together, and then you're gonna insert this plasmid into bacteria, and then the bacteria can start making insulin protein. Okay, um, I know this year we were unable to do the biotechnology labs, but you know you can actually order plasmids. Plasmids are made um, uh, by biotech companies, and you can order plasmids with specific genes in them, okay? Uh, and the plasmid that we would have ordered was the one with the red fluorescent protein from C anemone. So we would have ordered plasmid with um, red, uh, red fluorescent protein from um, a C anemone. And then we would have the bacteria make the protein for us, okay? And the reason why we chose the red fluorescent protein is because you can actually see it. It's a bright red protein. It's beautiful. So um, for human use, what can we use this uh, inserting plasmids, inserting genes into plasmids for? I already mentioned insulin, human growth hormone. So if we can, uh, if we can have bacteria make human growth hormone for us, it could be used as treatment for um, people that might be having some uh, endocrine problems or hormone problems, which where they won't reach their... Um, their height potential, okay? Lactase is another uh, example of um, how we use bacteria to make the lactase enzyme for us, and then you can add it, you know, in a pill, right? You can make, you can make lactase pills that people can take right before they eat any sort of a food or drink any, anything with uh, lactose in it, okay? So lactase um, is an enzyme that you can take in a pill form, and where do they get it from? They get it from bacteria, okay? The bacteria make it for us. So yeah, let's talk about these restriction enzymes. What cuts the DNA? What are these DNA scissors, okay? So how do we cut DNA? We use restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes are called restriction endonucleases because they're inside of a bacteria they're inside of a bacteria that is a nuclease. A nuclease is an enzyme that's going to break, um, break down the uh, nucleotides of nucleic acids. It was discovered back in the 1960s. Um, nucleases uh, or restriction enzymes were found back in the 1960s. They're found in bacteria and they cut up foreign DNA. And this kind of makes sense because it's a defense mechanism. Okay. It's a defense mechanism that E. coli or bacteria have against phages. So remember when a phage attacks an E. coli bacteria, they inject their DNA into the poor little E. coli. Well, you know, if that E. coli has restriction enzymes, those restriction enzymes can start cutting up the DNA. So we use restriction enzymes with plasmid technology 
to cut plasmids open so we can insert the gene of interest into the plasmid. So you might hear this term restricted a lot. Restriction just means to cut. Okay, it means to cut. And they're going to cut, these restriction enzymes are going to cut at very specific sequences. Okay, um, scientists have identified specific restriction enzymes that will cut at very specific sequences. And we'll go over um, that in just a few minutes. Okay. So the action of the enzyme is to cut DNA at specific sequences at a specific restriction site. Okay. And these restriction sites are palindromes. Okay. Palindromes. You guys know what palindromes are? Right, palindromes are basically words that are spelled forward the same as backwards. Okay, um, there's a lot of uh, 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 palindromes um, out there, and I should have looked one up so I can give you an example. Um, I'll probably, maybe I'll try to put one up here. Okay, and it produces producing and en uh, protruding ends called sticky ends which will bind to any complementary DNA, okay? And there are many different kinds of enzymes, those ECOR1, HIN3, BAMH1, and SMA1, okay? So an example of one, let me just move my head out of the way, would be ECOR1, okay? ECOR1 is a widely used restriction enzyme that will recognize this genetic sequence. G-A-A-T-T-C. And the palindrome on the opposite end is G-A-A-T-T-C. Okay? And it's going to cut right in between the guanine and adenine. Cut right between the guanine and adenine. So the phosphodiester bonds, you know, the DNA backbone, are broken using these enzymes. And then um, the hydrogen bonds that hold the A's and the T's together in the middle, they're very weak. So they can easily, easily be, be broken, okay? I'm just looking at palindrome because I, now it's bothering me, um, you know. Oh, madam, okay, madam is, a, is an example of a madam, because the way that you spell it this way is the same that way. So for this genetic sequence, G-A-A-T-T-C on one DNA strand. On the opposite DNA strand, it's G-A-A-T-T-C. So these restriction enzymes, they look for these palindrome sequences and they cut specifically in a specific site called the restriction site. So here are some examples of, um, oh, I'll show you guys in just a minute. But here again, this is ECOR1. ECOR1 restriction enzyme is going to cut between the guanine and adenine, between the guanine and adenine, this is the palindrome sequence, and then the hydrogen bonds are going to be cut there. And so you're going to end up with, uh, a f with two fragments, fragment number one, fragment number two, okay? Um, and you're going to end up what we call sticky ends, or sticky ends. These ends are going to be protruding out, okay? So yeah, you can see that here, ECOR1, is a restriction enzyme that recognizes GAA TTC. It's going to cut here. GAA TTC. It's going to cut there. And you're going to end up um, with these four nucleotides. Okay, on the sticky ends, they are not bound to any nucleotides, so they're not. They don't have a complementary nucleotide opposite to them. So they're sticky ends, and we call sticky ends because they can form hydrogen bonds with complementary nucleotides. That's why we call them sticky, because this, this thymine, this thymine, this adenine, this adenine can bind to nucleotides that are complementary to them, okay? And so if we're gonna use, like, if we wanna insert a gene of interest, we're gonna use the same restriction enzyme to cut DNA, because then you'll end up with the same sticky ends that are complementary to each other, okay? So here are some Examples of uh, restriction enzymes, one, two, three, four, five, and we already definitely talked about ECOR1, GAA, TTC. HIND3, okay, um, recognizes AAGCTT, AAGCTT, and it cuts in between the A's and the A's, the two adenines, and you end up with a sticky end there, okay? BAMH1 recognizes G-G-A-T-C-C, G-G-A-T-C-C, okay? So these three will actually produce um, sticky ends, okay, protruding ends, 
uh, with that are not paired with complementary nucleotides but these two alu1 and he3 these are two uh, restriction enzymes that actually produces blunt ends so they're just cutting right down um, the phosphodiester bonds that hold the backbone of the DNA it just cuts right down the middle and it recognizes a very short sequence AGCT AGCT so it recognizes these um, these palindrome short sequences GGCC GGCC okay so it's um, you know these restriction enzymes are found uh, in bacteria and we can take those restriction enzymes out and use them for our own purposes okay so again this is biotechnology genetic engineering we're taking what's already available and we're using them for um, manipulating for manipulation of DNA okay so HIND3 uh, restriction enzyme when we, you're going to also hear that word digest okay digest not it does does not mean to eat and break down okay digest means to cut or restrict so it's this digest is the same thing as to restrict or to cut oops okay cut so there's so many there's three words mean the same thing digest cut restrict they're going to cut here they're going to cut here so hen 3 is going to cut there and form sticky ends here's a sticky end there's a sticky end okay it's a protruding end and these nucleotides are not paired up but they are sticky because they can pair up with the same sticky end okay with if there's a a g c t okay pst1 here's another one it recognizes c t g c a g c t g c a g and it's going to cut between the a's and the g's and you're going to end up with um sticky ends and then this is eco rv a different one which is going to produce a blunt end okay and then again this is a video which i'm not going to go over but we will in class okay so with sticky ends we can cut other dna with the same enzymes and you're going to end up with um, sticky ends that are going to be complementary together and you can therefore glue the sticky ends together so this is let's say this is our you know target gene maybe for insulin if you can cut the dna on both sides with the same palindrome okay because you know our dna you know we have three billion base pairs and you're going to find palindromes restriction enzymes are going to find palindromes in our sequences okay if you can find um the maybe this is eco r1 okay eco r1 restriction site eco r1 restriction sites okay here and here okay on either side of the insulin gene then it's perfect because now we have a segment of dna that we can insert into a plasmid so our plasmid is going to have that restriction site GAATTC so now it's cut open and do you guys see how this sticky end is now going to be complementary to that sticky end right so see this the sticky end is complementary to that sticky end and then um, this sticky end is complementary to that sticky end so you can you can insert it in okay it's like a it's like a Lego piece that fits perfectly why why do we want to mix genes together why do we want to put the insulin gene into the plasmid well you know we want we are able to use um, bacteria we're able to use other organisms to produce proteins okay for us like the human insulin gene and so when we insert the human insulin gene then what do we do with it okay what do we do with it we put the human insulin gene in a plasmid and then you have the bacteria be transformed and now that bacteria can take um, that gene uh, and transcribe it, translate it, remember transcription, translation, protein synthesis, here's our amino acid sequence, okay, there's our amino acid sequence, there's our human insulin protein, so the bacteria are making it for us, and then we actually have to purify it, um, they're making the insulin protein inside of their cells, so we actually have to, um, unfortunately, like, kill the bacteria, the bacteria are just going to, like, burst open, you basically add like salts and salts and soap to the bacteria and then their membrane just breaks open and releases the insulin protein and then you have to extract the insulin protein 
from um, the solution. Okay, and that's called purification. And then once biotech companies can purify the protein, they can put it in vials, and then if it's approved by FDA, they can sell it. And then here's a picture of vials of insulin and uh, syringes, okay, with the purified protein. And how can bacteria read human DNA? Like, how are bacteria able to take this gene and transcribe it and translate it in protein synthesis? Well, remember the genetic code is universal, right? So. UUU is going to code for phenylalanine in a human, in a plant, in an, um, uh, you know, in other organisms, in bacteria. UUU codes for the same thing. CCC codes for the same amino acid proline. So, since all living organisms use like the same, you know, nucleotide bases, the A, T, Gs, and Cs, the same DNA, we're able to use the same genetic code chart, and each codon on the mRNA is read the same way uh, in every organism. So we can take that human DNA, put it in a plasmid, and then to have the um, plasmid go into the bacteria, and then the bacteria is going to transcribe those genes, translate it the same way that our um, cells would do. Okay? So yeah, the bacteria are there, then transformed, and then um, uh, we can also actually have... so. You know, here's our plasmid with several, you know, genes in there, okay? And you can have the, the bacteria reproduce, and when the bacteria are reproducing, they're cloning the plasmid with them. So then we're going to get multiple copies of the plasmid, multiple copies of the human gene. So there, that's one way that we can take advantage of that as well, as well excuse me. Um, is not only do the bacteria make the human protein for us, but when they reproduce, they're also also making copies of the gene for us, okay? So um, that's another thing that we can do, right? So here's our plasmid. We cut it with the same, you know, um, restriction enzyme that's going to be used to cut out the human gene of interest. And then you're going to end up with the same sticky ends that can be glued. So it's going to glue the... Uh, the gene of interest into our um, plasmids. So now we call this a vector because the vector is going to go inside of the organism and take the gene with it. And this is our recombinant plasmid because we're recombining genes from different organisms. We have a bacterial plasmid and then we have maybe a human gene. So we're using two uh, t um, DNA from two different organisms. We're recombining it. So here's our transformed bacteria. They can reproduce. So now, you know, these uh, bacteria all have the same uh, plasmids. Now we have multiple copies of that human gene, right? And then we're going to um, have the bacteria make the protein for us. And then we have to purify the protein. And then we're going to put the purified protein in little vials and sell it. That's what, that's what um, biotech companies do. Like, I guess Humulin is a type of insulin uh, produced by a biotech company. So Humulin, human insulin, must be a play on words, okay? So that recombinant plasmid is a type of recombinant DNA technology, okay? So we could take DNA isolated from two sources, the plasmid from the bacteria, and maybe the gene of interest from a human cell, recombine them together, uh, and then we could put we can actually put that plasmid, maybe not in the bacteria, but we could put that plasmid in another organism and have that organism express genes, okay? So an example of this would be like in corn, and we'll be going over that um, example later on. We go over um, genetically modified organisms, but we can have corn that is now genetically modified because now those cells that are in the plant have a plasmid with the gene of interest, okay? Maybe we want the corn to be resistant to a pest, okay? So right over here, gene for pest resistance. So some uses of the genes. Gene for toxic cleanup. We can insert um, a gene into bacteria that's going to help them be able to um, digest, get rid of, break down oil spills. So that's what's going on in this diagram. There's an oil spill, but then if the bacteria are laid down where the, there's an oil spill, they can break down the oil, okay? Um, I didn't know about this, but um, 
you know, some jeans, blue jeans, can be stone washed. So instead of using pumice, which is a type of stone, you can add um, an enzyme um, from, oh, it's called cellulase, that's what it's called. I almost forgot the name of it. Cellulase is the enzyme that breaks down cellulose, okay? But in this case, you know, blue jeans are made from cotton, right? And so um, uh, cotton, which has made up of like plant fibers, cellulose. So you can make the jeans softer when you can break down the cotton using the enzyme cellulase. So we can have bacteria produce cellulase for us for the purpose of stonewashing jeans, okay, stonewashing, getting it to look a little bit more worn and comfortable, okay, rather than like hard jeans, um, you can make the jeans a little bit more comfortable by stonewashing it. Instead of using pumice, stone, you can use cellulase uh, in a solution, you know, dunk the jeans in there and then the jeans come out, you know, more comfortable. Okay, and then some other um, proteins that can be used is proteins for dissolving clots, um, so we can have bacteria make these proteins that are going to help um, people that might have um, clotting issues, okay? So the genetically modified organism, or GMO, okay? Here are some examples of that, one, two, three. This, uh, these examples, they can enable plants to produce new proteins. Like, for example, the corn I was talking about. We can insert a plasmid with the gene that allows for the corn to be resistant to uh, insects, okay, some, um, the corn borer, the corn borer, uh, which is a type of caterpillar that's going to eat away at the corn and destruct maybe, um, you know, that year's crop production, okay, so the corn produces a bacterial toxin that kills the corn borer, these caterpillars, okay, or maybe, um, I think I mentioned this before, but Strawberries, some strawberries are called fish berries. These are strawberries with the anti-freezing gene from a flounder fish, okay? So flounder can live in very um, cold water temperatures, like maybe Arctic areas, Arctic streams or Arctic waters, okay? And so um, the gene that allows for them to um, not freeze to death can be inserted into into strawberry so that they can withstand cold uh, climates. Okay, so the strawberries can withstand and grow in cold climates. And then there's something called golden rice. Like in this picture, you can see golden rice versus white rice. The golden rice um, has genes that are going to allow for them to produce a high concentration of vitamin A. So the golden rice would be really great for areas where people do not have access to uh, nutritious food. The golden rice would give them some uh, extra vitamins that would otherwise not be available to them. Okay. And here are some interesting organisms. Um, this mouse or rat, and then you have a pig with a jellyfish gene inserted into them. Okay, so the jellyfish, here's some jellyfish that produce a protein called green fluorescent protein. They have a gene. So jellyfish naturally have this gene for GFP or green fluorescent protein, but what scientists did was they took that gene and then they put it in a plasmid and then they inserted those plasmids into the, um, the cells of a, of a mouse embryo and pig embryo. And then as they grow and develop, all of the cells by mitosis are also going to have these, um, these genes. And so, uh, now they are growing, or I should say glowing, they're glowing green because they have the green gene in their genome. So they're transformed vertebrate examples. All right, so let's talk about some other uses of restriction enzymes. So besides, okay, we can use restriction enzymes to cut out genes, human genes, and insert them into cut plasmids. Besides that, we can use restriction enzymes for other things. We can use it to cut up DNA from other people, from people, and compare it. Okay, why would we want to compare people's DNA? Maybe for forensic reasons, medical diagnostics, if we're looking for genetic disorders, paternity tests. We can use um, the different uh, DNA fragments when it's cut up by restriction enzymes to study evolutionary relationships, and many, much, much more, okay? 
So we're going to cut up human DNA using restriction enzymes. And what do we end up with? We're going to end up with fragments of DNA of different sizes. Okay. So we're going to end up with DNA fragments of different sizes, but then we're going to separate them using gel electrophoresis technology. Okay. So when you cut up someone's DNA, you're going to end up with fragments and you can actually separate the fragments according to size in, um, in an apparatus called, or a machine called gel electrophoresis. And basically the DNA is put in a gel. It's called gel electrophoresis because you put the DNA in these gel, in the gel, and then they, the DNA will move through the gel. And it's called agrose, that gel is called agrose because it comes from algae, okay? And then here's just a really old photo. Of, do you guys see these bands? Okay, these bands are dyed DNA fragments. So the fragments that were cut up using restriction enzymes, they were dyed and then they were able to travel through the gel. And this is where you put them. You put the DNA in these wells and then you turn the gel electrophoresis machine on and then the DNA will start to move down the, these lanes. Um, and then it separates the DNA fragments by size. The smaller fragments will end up further They'll travel farther, whereas the large pieces of DNA, because they're so large, they, can, they can't move as fast through the gel, okay? So we're going to be talking about how gel electrophoresis works now. Basically, it's a method of separating DNA in a gelatin-like, that's what's called gel, made out of agarose, which is from algae, okay, um, using an electrical field, okay? Remember how we talked about DNA is negatively charged and DNA is negatively charged because of the phosphate groups. Remember those oxygens have negative charges on them. So DNA is negatively charged. And when you put DNA in an electrical field, they will be attracted to the positive end. Okay. So there's our DNA. We're going to put DNA in the gel well. Okay. So the gel is this yellow uh, solid thing. Okay. You're going, to put, you're going to put DNA in that well or a hole in the gel. This is the, D, this is the negative end. So there's an electrode, a negative electrode put in here, and then there's a positive electrode put there. And then when you turn the gel electrophoresis apparatus on, those DNA fragments are going to move through the gel, and they're attracted to the positive end. Okay, Because DNA has a negative charge, they're going to move through the gel attracted to the, to the positive end, to the positive end. And again, the smallest fragments can move the fastest through the gel, whereas the largest piece of DNA, the largest pieces of DNA cannot move through the gel easily. So they're going to kind of lag behind. So this is how we can separate the DNA fragments. When we take someone's DNA and cut it up, using restriction enzymes, those fragments um, are going to be produced. You're going to have small fragments, you know, and large fragments, and you can separate the fragments in a gel electrophoresis apparatus where the smallest fragments can move the fastest through the gel. And then the largest ones are going to just lag behind. Okay. And it is, you know, the gel, the gel is like jello. Okay. So they have to, the DNA has to swim through it and the smaller fragments, um, they don't have as much drag, so they're going to go through the jello a lot faster, okay? So when that DNA moves through an electrical field, right, um, the, small, the smaller size of DNA uh, is going to travel further. So the size of the DNA fragment affects how far it's going to travel. Small pieces travel farther, large pieces travel slower and lag behind. It's sort of like a Mack truck is a large fragment Whereas a motorcycle would be a small fragment and it can travel through, you know, um, traffic, right? Travel through the gel a lot faster, okay? If it's smaller. So uh, what you do is you take your DNA, you cut up the DNA using restriction enzymes, and then you set them in wells. And then the wells, when you turn on the gel electrophoresis power source, the gel apparatus, it's going to separate the DNA. There's a negative ch charge here, positive charge here. The DNA is going to move to the positive end because DNA is negatively charged. It's attracted to the positive side. Okay. The shorter the fragment, the farther it can travel. 
the longer the fragment, the slower it's going to move through the gel. Okay, so um, we're not going to go into too much detail about how gel electrophore, how do you see the bands of DNA, but you do need to dye the DNA. You have to add a dye so you can actually visually see that. DNA is clear, okay, it's a clear substance. Gels are also clear, they're clear, so it's really hard to see DNA. So you would have to stain the DNA um, in order for you to see it, okay? So, you know, one of the uses that I mentioned, like how do we use um, restriction enzymes and um, separating DNA according to size, what do we use it for? One of them was to study evolutionary relationships. You know, you know the more we have in common with an organism, that shares, that means that we share a common ancestor, right? So when we compare DNA samples from different organisms, we can share, we can measure, sorry, evolutionary relationships. The more we have in common with them, with an organism, the, the uh, more information it gives us as to which organism, which common ancestor that we share, okay? So here we have five different organisms one, two, three, four, five, five different species or organisms. And when you cut up their DNA and then you put them in a gel electrophoresis apparatus, you can compare the fragments of DNA, okay? Like these two fragments are the same size because they have traveled the same distance, okay? Whereas these three fragments have traveled the same distance because they are the same size. Okay, same goes here. These two are the same size, um, and so they've traveled the same distance. So when you look at these six species of organisms, which two would you say is the most closely related? Okay, so I'll just give you a second. Maybe you guys can pause the video here. But which two organisms, one, two, three, four, five, you know, which two are the most closely related? You would have to look for fragments that they share that are the same size okay so when i look at um you know i look at one and two they're very similar right i mean they share these three fragments of dna together um and then when i look at three and four they share a lot of fragments as well but you know because three and four share the most, I would say that they are most closely related to each other, and one and two are also mostly uh, uh, closely related to each other, which organism would kind of be the, what we call the out group, you know, the one that would be the least related would be number five. Number five is not, you know, not closely related to either of one, with none, with none, any of these, one, two, three, uh, one, two, three, four, okay? It does share a DNA fragment with one and two um, all by itself. And then it does share a fragment with three and four there and then all by itself. Okay, so we can what we can do with this is we can draw a, um, an evolutionary tree. Okay, we can draw an evolutionary tree. Okay, so number five is what we call the out group. You know, it com this is a this is the common ancestor of all, you know, of all five, the common ancestor. But five, you know, it doesn't, when you look at the, the fragments, um, it's the least related to the others. Like one and two, you can group together, right? One and two, you can group together. Three and four, you can group together. We're going to be talking about phylogenetic trees. Um, that's our next unit. And you'll definitely learn how to read a phylogenetic tree. But basically, one and two are grouped together. They come from the same branch because they share a, a more recent common ancestor. So like their common ancestor would be at this branching point. So their common ancestor would be there. And for three and four, they share a lot of fragments. A lot of DNA is very similar to each other. So their common ancestor would be at that fork, okay? And then the common ancestor for all five would be way down at the bottom of the tree, okay? Oh, so yeah, uh, turtle, snake, rat, squirrel, fruit fly, okay? All right, and then another use for, um, uh, uh, sorry, I'm so tired, of um, the enzymes, restriction enzymes, is, uh, is cutting up DNA and comparing them to figure out um, 
maybe coming up with a medical diagnosis of a disease, okay? Because we know what a normal allele looks like. We know, and then we want to know if someone has a disease causing allele or if it's normal or not, okay? So comparing normal allele to disease allele. So this is what the normal allele would look like. So someone with the DNA sequence that's normal, that you would end up with one, two, three fragments. So this would be normal. And you're going to see you know, these three fragments have these specific sizes. Like this would be the smallest size. This would be smallish, okay? And then this would be like the largest size. So someone that's normal, this is what you would see. You would see three fragments and you would see that these fragments traveled that, that far. But someone with, let's say, Huntington's disease, this is what their DNA would look like. Remember, because of their mutations, they're going to have a slightly different DNA sequence, and so you're going to end up with different fragments, okay? Someone with um, Huntington's disease, um, when you cut up their DNA, you're going to end up um, with five fragments, the fifth fragment being the, the smallest. And then uh, fragment number four is shared with the normal. So this would, maybe that's a maybe that's a sequence of DNA that's completely normal. There's no mutation in that segment. Okay, and then you have three, two, and one. Okay, so you can compare. You can use restriction enzymes, cut up people's DNA, and you can compare them, a normal with uh, Huntington's disease. So you know you can do a genetic test this way to see if you are a carrier for for a disease. For let's say, remember we talked about with like breast cancer, for example, BRCA1, BRCA2. How do, you think, how do scientists know that you've inherited those genes? You can do gel electrophoresis. They know what it looks like on a gel. When you cut up the DNA with restriction enzymes, you, they know what it looks like when they run it through a gel, okay? And then we can use it for forensics, compare DNA sample from the crime scene with sus suspects and victims, okay? So let's say that somebody, um, you know, somebody was murdered, okay? At the crime scene, they picked up the DNA. So this is the DNA sample from the crime scene. And then this is the victim's DNA. So you can kind of, like, whatever DNA is found at the crime scene, you want to know if it's from the victim or from the suspect, okay? Um, okay, and then there's three suspects. Suspect one, two, and three. So you want to find you want to find DNA fragments from the crime scene matching up with either the victim or the suspect. You want to you want to see matching fragments with the victim and the suspect. Okay. So um, when I see this fragment, it came from either not the victim, right? The victim doesn't have that fragment, but it came from either suspect number two or three. And then when I see this fragment, it did not come from the victim, but it came from maybe suspect two. And then when I look at this fragment, it didn't come from the victim, but it might have come from suspect two. So you guys can see here that, um, I mean, who was who most likely, most likely the um, criminal at the crime scene that may have murdered our victim it's going to be suspect two, okay? Because when you look at the DNA evidence, it matches up. The crime scene DNA evidence matches up with suspect number two, okay? So in a court, uh, in a case, okay, um, they could use this DNA evidence saying that suspect number two is guilty as charged. So, you know, um, when you look at the suspects and the victim, they all have they all have their own unique individual fragments that are separated, right? We call that a DNA fingerprint. A DNA fingerprint is comparing blood samples um, from different people, and you run the DNA after you cut it with the restriction enzymes. You run it through a gel, and everybody has their own unique DNA fingerprint. Okay. DNA fingerprinting is comparing DNA banding patterns between different individuals. We all have unique patterns, okay? So again, I, you can use this for forensics, comparing blood samples on defendant's clothing to determine if it belongs to the victim. So, and this is a real, this is an actual photo of a real case um, where you had a victim, 
Okay, so this is the victim's blood. And then um, this is the blood, blood from defendant's clothes. So somebody is being accused. Okay, so the defendant is the one that's being accused. On this, um, the defendant wearing jeans and a shirt. Okay, on the jeans and the shirt, they found blood. Okay, and they, they, they took DNA from that blood. And they wanted to know, you know, is that blood from the victim or is the blood from the defendant? Because, you know, if the defendant at the scene is covered in blood, maybe the blood came from the defendant. Like, maybe he cut himself and he didn't, you know, he didn't kill the victim. You know, maybe he cut himself and there's blood all over his clothes or her clothes. Okay, well, let's see here. Blood um, found on the jeans and shirt. Who does it match? Does it match the victim or the defendant? When I look at these lines, the DNA fingerprint that I see here belongs to the victim, okay? So blood on the jeans, blood on the shirt, the DNA fingerprint matches the victim. So that means that the defendant was found with um, clothes, bloody clothes that match the victim's blood. But does that mean that the defendant is guilty? Does it? Okay, I mean, how did the defendant get the victim's blood on their clothes? Either they're guilty of murder or maybe they were trying to help out the victim, right? Maybe they were trying to assist the, the victim. Maybe the victim was bleeding to death and the defendant was trying to save their life. Who knows, okay? But this is an actual picture or photograph of a gel electrophoresis um, result from an actual case, okay? So what makes these people different? What makes a defendant different from the victim? Why is each person's DNA pattern different? Well, remember how we talked about nine, like 98% of your DNA is like junk DNA, it doesn't code for protein. There's a lot of repeated patterns of DNA. So you can have a lot of CAT, a lot of cats in your genome. You can have a lot of GCCs in your genome. And each person um, has inherited from their parents you know, each person has inherited from their parents um, different number of repeats. And that's why siblings have similar number of repeats because they inherited from their parents, okay? But with unrelated people, when you're comparing DNA from non-related, unrelated people, you're going to have different amount of CATs and GCCs in the junk DNA. So for example, this person, so these two people, so this is person number one, this is person number two, they're not related. But this person has CAT, CAT, CAT repeated three times. Whereas this person has CAT repeated one, two, three, four, five, six times. So double the amount, okay? And then when you use a restriction enzyme to cut their DNA, um, I don't know which restriction enzyme, but let's just say a restriction enzyme cuts here. How is that gonna happen though? Do I have a palindrome? I don't know if I have a palindrome that's here, but let's say that there is a palindrome like here and here, okay? Um, so it's gonna cut it here and here. Then, uh, and then, uh, let me see if I can find a, s a similar sequence. Yeah, right there and like right there, okay? You're gonna end up with a DNA fragment here that's shorter. This DNA fragment is shorter than this DNA fragment because the repeating sequences are different between these two unrelated people. Does that make sense? Okay, so you're gonna use restriction enzymes to cut up people's DNA. Some people's fragments are gonna be longer than others because they're gonna have a lot more repeated sequences. Whereas somebody else might only have it repeated three times. Their DNA fragments are gonna be shorter. So everyone's you know, DNA fragments are gonna travel um, according to size and everybody has different size DNA, a DNA fingerprint, okay? So here uh, is an example of DNA patterns for DNA fingerprinting. Oh, it's that example of the CAT, okay? So we cut it with restriction enzymes. So for over here, for allele one, you should end up with a fragment like this size, okay? And then a fragment this size, and then this fragment should be this size, okay? So you're gonna end up with three fragments. And these are the three fragments shown here. This is probably the smallest one because it's going to travel the furthest. So let's say, oh, let's number them. Okay, so this is fragment number one, fragment number two, and then fragment number three. Okay, and it's kind of hard to see if 
I think um, the shortest one is going to be three and then one and then two. Okay. And then, um, yeah. And then so for somebody else, when you cut their DNA, the one with the a lot of repeats. So here's number one, here's number two, and here's number three. You know, their number three is far back, right? So this was number one and number two, okay? Their number three is like far back because it's so big, it's gonna travel slower through the gel, okay? So do you guys see how like, how people, the amount of repeats that are found in an individual varies? And that's gonna give us di different DNA banding patterns on the gel electrophoresis, okay? On the gel, you're gonna see different banding patterns because of the amount of different repeats. So one that has a lot more, their DNA fragments are much longer, and so you're gonna, it's gonna travel a lot slower through the gel. And you know, the differences between people, it's called uh, rifflips, rifflips. The differences that we find in a population are called rifflips or restriction fragment length polymorphism. You know, that word polymorphism means many forms, you know, and between unrelated people, you're gonna end up with many um, different uh, lengths of DNA fragments. That's many different forms. Different differences in DNA between individuals is gonna give us unique DNA fingerprints, okay? So someone, okay, might have allele one where, um, it cuts between the C's and this, it recognizes the CCGG, CCGG, and it's cut between the C and the C, okay, here and here. So for this person, you're gonna end up with three fragments. Fragment Y, sorry, W, fragment W, fragment X, fragment Y. And which one is the smallest? Fragment Y. So Y is gonna travel the furthest, right there. And then W is next, and then X is the largest fragment, it's gonna be the slowest to travel. But then, if this person has allele two, they don't have that sequence. They don't have the CCGG, okay? They don't have a CCGG. They have an ACGG. So that is not a recognition site. That is not a recognition site for that restriction enzyme. The restriction enzyme will, will recognize that site. It'll cut it there. So you're not gonna end up with three fragments like allele one, you're gonna end up with two fragments, Y and Z. And Z is the longest fragment out of all of the fragments, so it's gonna be the furthest one. It's gonna be the one that's lagging the furthest because it's the largest fragment, okay? And then Y can travel the furthest because it's the smallest um, fragment, okay? So like uh, everyone has different DNA sequences, that are recognized, um, they're gonna have different DNA sequences. So you're gonna have restriction enzymes that are recognizing you know, different restriction sites. You're gonna end up with different fragments. And then when you run it on a gel, everyone has their own unique DNA fingerprint, which is the banding pattern, okay? So we can use, again, like I said, for forensics, uh, and this was the first case in 1987 where um, DNA fingerprinting was used successfully, I guess, against uh, convicting a guy named Tommy Lee Andrews of, uh, in a rape case, okay? Okay, moving on. How can you compare DNA from blood and from semen and red blood cells? So, you know, this, is a, this was a rape case. So on the, on the, um, the victim, they took a semen sample, and from the semen sample, they were able to look at the DNA um, fragments, okay? And then you look at the blood from um, the, you take a blood sample from the suspect, blood sample from, yeah, from the suspect, and then uh, from the semen sample, and you just compare it, okay? But now you don't need to do blood, right? You don't need to take blood sample from somebody. Now you can just do a, a, a simple cheek swab, right? You go in with a, a Q-tip and you take some cheek inside the mouth swab. You don't have to do blood sample now, okay? But this is back in the 80s when they did use blood. Okay, and then we can also do um, use um, restriction enzyme and gel electrophoresis technology to do paternity tests, like who's the daddy? Who's the father, right? Who's the daddy? So here, when you take um, 
DNA from the mom and then you cut it up using restriction enzymes and then you take the DNA from the child and you take uh, you cut up their child's DNA with the restriction enzymes so here's the mom here's the and then these are the two possible dads the two possible father father number one and two so when you look at the child's DNA fragments their DNA came from mom and dad right so whichever DNA fragment you see in the child it has to come from either mom or dad you know these fragments have to come from mom or dad okay so this first fragment mom does not have that right mom does not have that fragment so it has to come from father number two but let's take a look at all the other fragments this fragment this is not shared by any of the fathers but it is shared with mom this fragment is shared with father number two this fragment is shared with father number two this fragment is shared with mom this fragment is shared with father number two i think it's becoming clear who the daddy is right all right so father number two is the dad according to the paternity test this reminds me of like that show maury right maury um you are not the dad or you are not the father <laughs> okay and you know what i found this online i just thought it was so crazy uh there was a, a reality tv show called who's your daddy and this was like a long time ago i think this was um it says it right there 2005 it aired on fox tv january 3rd 2005 it was a short-lived and controversial it was just one episode reality show where the woman she didn't know who her dad was so there were eight contestants and in order for her to win a hundred thousand dollar prize she had to uh, she had to um correctly identify her dad if she did not correctly identify the dad then um i think the dad would have won a hundred thousand would have won the hundred thousand anyway so that is just crazy, right? I don't think they would do that now, but this is back in 2005. Using, using um, gel electrophoresis technology, using restriction enzyme technology, okay? Okay, here is, um, here is a practice question. The segment of DNA shown in the figure below has restriction sites. That's where the restriction enzymes cut. One and two, so it's gonna cut right over here and right over here, which create restriction fragments A, B, and C. So, you know, if there's two sites where it's cut, you're going to end up with three fragments, right? Which of the gel produced by electrophoresis shown below would or on the side represent the separation identity of these fragments, okay? So you guys know that fragment B is probably, it's the smallest, so it's going to travel the furthest, okay? So this one's going to travel the furthest, then A, and then C, okay? And remember, DNA is negatively charged, so it's going to move towards the opposite uh, positive charge, okay? So B is going to travel the furthest. So it cannot be answer A choice because B, looking at that, it didn't travel the furthest. C, um, answer choice B is possibly an answer because B has traveled the furthest, then next A, and then C. And C is the longest fragment, so it's going to lag far behind, and I can see that here. So actually, I believe answer choice B is the answer because when I look at C, nope. When I look at E, nope. But if you look at answer choice D, B has traveled the furthest, but see how um, the distances between B and A and A and C are not that far, where when I look at the fragment, C is really big. So it should have lagged further behind. Um, and so um, I would say that, and since B is very small compared to C, it would have traveled a lot farther. So I would say the most accurate answer choice would be B, okay? Which of the following statements is consistent with the results below? So we're looking at four individuals, A, B, C, D. So for answer choice A, it says B is the child of A and C. So B is the child of A and C. So when we look at here, Okay, uh, it can't be true, right? Because this fragment is not shared by mom or dad. So answer choice A is not true. And then let me erase this so that I can, okay. 
And then let's look at answer choice B. C is the child of A and B. So C is the child of A and B. Okay, yeah, this looks possible, right? Because every um, answer choice, every, every fragment is accounted for from either A or B. So that's possible. Let's leave that open. So let's see. D is the child of B and C. No, that can't be the answer, right? Because when I look at D, this fragment is not shared by B or C. So it can't be that. Oh, sorry, this one. <laughs> and then let's get D. Uh, a is the child of B and C. A is the child. No, it can't be. It can't be answer choice D either because when you look at this uh, fragment, it doesn't come from B or C. And then A is the child of C and D. No, that can't be it either. So B is the correct answer. C is the child of A and B. What is the order of steps involved in polymerase chain reaction? You guys remember at the beginning we talked about PCR. You have to heat first. So you got to heat it first, and then you got to prime, and then you got to extend. So it's two, one, three. So two, one, three. So answer choice is B. Okay. Now let's talk about some other biotechnology. All right. Um, so we talked about sequencing. We talked about um, using restriction enzymes and producing, you know, recombinant plasmids so we can create genetically modified organisms. We talked about how gel electrophoresis and um, restriction enzymes can be used in several ways for um, forensics, for, you know, doing a paternity test, looking at DNA fingerprinting, okay? Um, now we're going to talk about cloned organisms and cell stem cells are useful for basic research and other applications. So a stem cell is basically a cell that is not differentiated. Okay? It hasn't gone through differentiation. It's basically a cell that has potential to become anything. And remember, we talked about in the previous chapter how a cell, when it becomes differentiated, that means that it's making cell-specific proteins. So a stem cell has not turned on any genes. It hasn't made any cell specific proteins yet okay it's not a specialized cell so here's a stem cell and when it divides by mitosis it can produce more stem cells or it can become a differentiated cell so a progenitor cell is one that is going to be determined to either become a fat cell a bone cell or a white blood cell so these cells are differentiated differentiated because it's gone through differential gene expression. Remember that term gene expression? Meaning that it's started making the proteins that are specific for those cell types. Fat cells have the genes turned on or expressing gel, uh, expressing genes specific for fat cells. Bone cells are expressing, making proteins that are specific for bone cells. White blood cells are making proteins that are specific for white blood cells, okay? So that means, that's what we mean by differentiated. The really unique thing about plants, though, is that in plants, mature cells that are already differentiated, they can actually become de-differentiated. So they can actually go back in time and become a stem cell. And then they can give rise to all specialized cells types of, uh, in that organism. So a plant cell, it can become de-differentiated. It is totipotent, totipotent. You guys, when you look at that word totipotent, it means it has a potential. It has a potential to become, to become any kind of cell. Toti meaning like totally, totally potential, okay? Totally, there's a total potential, total potential for it to become any type of cell and generate a completely new organism that is a clone of the cell that it came from, okay? And plant cloning is used extensively in agriculture. So here is what I mean by totipotent, okay? They can, oops, totipotent. Plant cells can de-differentiate and they have the potential uh, de-differentiate, okay? You can take a mature carrot, okay, a mature carrot, remove some cells from the root, okay? So, and then you can put it in a nutrient medium, meaning that it contains nutrients that are allowing for the cell to grow, divide, etc. 
And then those cells can actually become, um, those cells become embryonic. They become embryonic cells. And then when you put it in water or you put it in, um, yeah, water with nutrients or you put it in agar uh, nutrient medium, they will actually start to grow roots. They'll grow roots, they'll grow leaves, and then they'll grow into an adult carrot plant, okay? So these root cells can de-differentiate, become stem cells, and then grow into a new adult. So they have the potential to become a completely new individual that is a clone of itself, okay? Clone of the, the organism that it came from. And then this is another way that we clone in plants is by cutting, and this is used all the time, where you can like cut a stem off, you put it in water, you put it in soil, and it can grow roots into a new clone. Okay, um, a lot of people do that with like succulents, with basil. You can do it with so many different kinds of plants. That's a unique thing about plants, is that you can reproduce them asexually by cloning, just by cutting. Okay, but we have come very far with animals. Animals, it's not very easy to clone. Okay, but we've come pretty far. The very first attempts at cloning animals were done with frogs. Okay, what you do is you take a frog embryo. Um, and you take a frog embryo that has not been, you know, differentiated yet. You know, they haven't become, you know, um, they haven't become skin cells or liver cells or brain cells. You take a uh, undifferentiated cell and then you take out their nucleus. You take out the nucleus and you put it in an egg cell that is empty. So what they did here was they took an egg cell and they removed the, or they destroyed the nucleus. So it's an empty it's an empty egg, and you put the um, embryo nucleus in it, and now you have an egg with that, uh, that embryo nucleus, and then it starts to divide by mitosis, and it can develop into a tadpole. So this is a type of cloning because that tadpole came from this frog embryo, okay? So this frog embryo can become its own frog, and it can grow and develop into an own frog, but then if you take one of those cells, and you remove the nucleus and put it in an empty egg, it can divide and develop into another tadpole. And so you end up with two frogs and they're clones of each other, okay? And in this research with frogs, what they also tried to do was they took the nucleus out of the already differentiated cell. So in the first example, they took a nucleus out of an undifferentiated cell, but over here, they took the nucleus out of a completely differentiated intestinal cell. They implanted it into an empty egg and then it divided by mitosis, but it didn't develop further than um, the blastula, okay? Blastula or gastrula. It didn't de develop um, further than that. Gastrula. But, so that was one of the first cases, okay, dealing with um, animal cloning with the frog but we've come very far, okay? Back in 1997, um, the first mammal to be cloned was a sheep, okay? Dolly, Dolly was her name. Dolly, um, here's a picture of Dolly with her surrogate mother. This is her surrogate mother. So where did Dolly come from? Dolly is actually a fin dorset um, sheep. I don't know much about sheep, but I guess there's all these different breeds of sheep, just like there's different breeds of dogs, there's different breeds of sheep. There's the Scottish blackface um, who is the surrogate, but also the egg donor, okay? So they took one of her eggs and they removed the nucleus, just like with the frog experiment. You remove, so sorry, you remove the nucleus from the egg, okay, you remove it, you destroy it. Now you have an empty egg, the empty egg from the egg donor, the Scottish black, um, the Scottish blackface, okay? But you take the nucleus out of the fin dorset mammary cell. So they took some of, um, you know, basically the udder, you know, the udder of the sheep. They took a mammary cell from her, so it was differentiated. It was a differentiated cell. They took the nucleus out of the mammary cell. They put the nucleus in the empty egg and then you end up with an embryo. You end up with an embryo or a zygote, and then it starts to divide into a blastula and then a gastrula. And then at the blast, actually, at the blastula stage, they implanted it into the uterus of the 
blackface, Scottish blackface surrogate, the surrogate, okay? So the genetics, the genetics comes from the Finn Dorset, but the surrogate is a different breed, okay? So when Dolly was born, she was a Finn Dorset, her surrogate was a blackface, Scottish blackface, okay? So Dolly was a clone of this, um, of this sheep, okay? Uh, and this happened back in 1997. And um, yeah, I remember that because I had just graduated college. That was so long ago. And this was a success after 277 previous attempts. Um, I don't know about you guys, but if I tried to do an experiment over 200 times, I would be pretty discouraged. If it didn't work out on the 200th time, I'd be like, what am I doing wrong? I'm going to give up. But no, they didn't give up. Imagine if they did at the try 276. <laughs> what if they gave up then, right? Then they would have never cloned Dolly successfully. But after 277 attempts, they were able to clone her successfully. And actually, 277 is not that bad, okay, compared to other cloning attempts. So the Dolly was the first mammal to be um, cloned. Since 1997, we've clone cats and mice and cows and horses and mules and pigs and dogs, okay? Really cute carbon copy. Carbon copy was the first um, cat to be, uh, um, um, sorry, uh, oh, cloned, okay? Um, but they, her also name was um, copycat. So there's carbon copy and copycat. There were like two names for her. Cloned animals do not always look or behave exactly the same. And I'll show you guys a picture of copycat or carbon copy. And even when you look at humans, identical twins, even though they're genetically the same, there's always small, slight differences in them. Uh, and that would do to be due to epigenetics, okay? Where the environment might have some kind of impact on gene expression, okay? So here's copycat. Okay, what a cute little cat, huh? Clone from the donor rainbow. So this is copycat, and this is her clone. She is a clone of this cat, Rainbow. You know, they're both calico cats. So they're both calico, meaning they have the genes for having orange, orange fur and black fur. And those genes are on the X chromosome, on the X chromosome. So a calico cat has an X black gene and X orange gene. So wherever you see patches of orange, those X chromosomes with the orange gene are being expressed. Wherever you see black patches of fur, those um, patches of skin or, you know, um, uh, follicles, hair follicles, are producing um, the gene for black, okay? X big B or X black. So you guys remember, like we talked about um, bar bodies, how like in, in, in humans and in mammals, how one X chromosome is a, becomes a bar body, it becomes inactivated. That's why, um, that's why calico cats have patches because wherever you see the patches, wherever you see orange, that's where the orange X chromosome is being expressed. Wherever you see black patches, that's where the X black gene is being expressed. But in the orange patch, it's the X black gene or chromosome that it becomes a bar body. It becomes a bar body, okay? It's not being expressed. The thing about copycat, though, was she didn't look like, um, she didn't look like a, a, a calico cat, even though genetically she was. It just so happened that all of the X chromosomes that were being expressed, uh, all of the cells had the X big B being expressed. None of the oranges were expressed interestingly enough, okay? And then wherever you guys see white patches, that's just where the melanocytes during development, um, they didn't reach the front side. So I guess with animals with like white patches, like even with horses where they have that white patch on their head and their nose, it's because these certain cell called melanocytes, they start at the back and then they migrate towards the front. And by the time, you know, these animals are born, the melanocytes haven't reached the front and that's why they're colorless, they're white in the front, okay? So um, there's Rainbow and her clone copycat and then this is the surrogate mother 
Ali with the little baby copycat. So this is baby copycat with her surrogate mother. And then um, some Korean scientists, they were the first to clone a puppy. They named it Snuppy or Snoopy. I don't know. Snuppy, the clone puppy. Uh, and so I think it's an Afghan breed. So this is Snuppy. And then this is the, um, no, Snuppy was a, was a male. This is Snuppy. This is the clone Snup from the clone. Okay. The clone dad. And then this is what Snuppy is a clone of him. And then the surrogate was a um, type of lab, a Labrador. Okay. So, you know, if we're able to clone, if we can get DNA and, and just put it in an empty egg and let that egg divide by mitosis and develop, you know, should we clone extinct species? And this is a question um, that scientists are asking all the time, like the dodo bird is extinct, but we have their genome. You know, we have, we have sequenced the genome of Neanderthals. Should we clone uh, Neanderthals, you know, with they are the same species as us so uh scientists say no because like human cloning is like off limits right we don't clone humans and then we have a saber-toothed tiger you know should we we have their genome should we clone them who would be this who would be the surrogate of a uh, saber-toothed tiger it would have to be like a very big organism right same with the mammoth who would be the surrogate of a mammoth who would be the surrogate of a giant sloth or the passenger pigeon Passenger pigeon would probably be easier to clone because they're pretty small. They're the same size of, as a morning dove, so we could probably clone them in a morning dove and bring them back. I don't know, but this is a, some ethical questions that are raised. If we have the power to, the technology to clone, should we clone extinct species and bring them back? Hmm, interesting. Okay, and so that brings us to um, stem cell research uh, and humans, like how can we help humans, especially humans with genetic disorders, okay? But let's compare embryonic stem cells with adult stem cells. So an embryonic stem cell are stem cells from an embryo, and they have the potential to become any type of cell, okay? So embryonic stem cells, that's what ES stands for, are pluripotent. They can become any type of cell, okay? Whereas adult stem cells, which are made or found, actually not found, they're made in the bone marrow, okay? They're made in the bone marrow and then they go all over the body and they help repair um, damaged tissue. That's what those adult stem cells do. They actually go through your whole body and they can repair um, damaged tissue. But adult stem cells are multipotent. Multipotent means they can become two or more um, different types of cells, whereas embryonic stem cells, they can become any pluripotent, any type of cell. So an embryonic stem cell can become a liver cell, a nerve cell, a blood cell, you know, whereas um, a adult stem cell can become a blood cell, okay, it can become two or more different kinds of cells. Maybe it can become um, like a white blood cell, a red blood cell, okay. So that's the difference between adult stem cells and embryonic stem cells. Embryonic cell, stem cells are pluripotent, whereas adult stem cells are multipotent. Okay, um, here are some practical applications of DNA-based biotechnologies and how they can be applied to, to our lives right now. Medical applications. We can identify human genes in which mutations play a role in genetic diseases, right? We can identify genes that play a role in genetic diseases we can we can actually turn on or off genes of particular diseases so like let's say that there is a genetic disorder like sickle cell anemia we have the technology to turn that off though it's not completely accurate that's why we're not using it right now we have we're moving in that direction where we're able to turn off genes that are going to cause genetic disorders um, and gene therapy is basically the introduction of genes into an afflicted individual, maybe someone with a genetic disorder. Um, we can introduce a gene into them that would replace uh, their, um, their cells. It would replace their cells. We would replace their cells with cells with the appropriate a normal gene, okay? And this was the very first gene therapy was done on 10 kids 
with skids okay skids is a um is a genetic disorder where their immune system is severely severely compromised uh, they have to like live in a bubble basically because they are literally allergic to everything okay which could kill them so they have to live in a bubble and the reason why is because their immune system is so sensitive to the environment and their immune cells are made in the bone marrow so the idea is to remove their cells their bone marrow cells and insert into their bone marrow cells the correct gene and then put the bone marrow cells back into their bone marrow where they can divide by mitosis and produce normal immune cells okay so the idea is to take a normal gene a cloned normal gene insert that normal gene into a retrovirus okay a retrovirus we, we're unfortunately not going to talk about retroviruses, but retroviruses are viruses with RNA as their genetic material. And then they also have a um, enzyme, um, an enzyme oh, called reverse transcriptase. I almost forgot. Reverse transcriptase. And the interesting thing about these retroviruses is that they will inject their RNA into a host cell and then that RNA is going to act as a template for DNA and then that DNA strand can act as a template for another DNA strand to make double-stranded DNA okay so basically what's happening is that an RNA virus um, it's going to inject their RNA so let's say this is the 5 prime this is the 3 prime end of the RNA into the host cell and then that enzyme that enzyme reverse transcriptase so let's say that's our enzyme can make a DNA copy of that mRNA okay and now that DNA is going to act as a template for another DNA strand so I'm going to draw it down here so there's our DNA template for another DNA okay strand so this is the 5 and 3 5 so now we have double stranded DNA genetic material of the virus okay and so what what the reverse trans what the a retrovirus does is now we have double stranded dna that belongs to the virus and it's going to insert itself into the host genome this is how hiv works hiv is a retrovirus they're going to insert themselves into the host genome okay so um with gene therapy you can insert into the viral RNA, the clone gene, okay, and then put it inside of the patient's bone marrow cell, and then the hope is, the hope is that the virus will insert itself into the chromosome of the host, the patient, and then you go ahead and you inject the bone cells in back into the person okay and then that person now has the correct gene inside of them does that make sense because the virus did all of the work the virus did the work okay the virus made its you know made that DNA and inserted itself okay into the host DNA the only problem is like when they first did this um, I think over 20 years ago in France they did it they did this experiment on 10 children with skids and it worked for 9 out of the 10 kids but several of them died of leukemia and so what happened was they were thinking that maybe the virus inserted itself the double-stranded DNA from the virus inserted itself into um, the chromosome causing mutations because it's like inserting its DNA into the chromosomes into the genome of that patient causing mutations so this type of gene therapy is not very accurate because we don't have control of over the viral over the virus we don't know where the virus is going to insert its DNA okay so the viral DNA can insert itself into the host genome but we don't know where it's going to insert itself and so it can actually cause mutations so that didn't work out however our next I guess um, gene technology that was developed recently in the last decade is CRISPR Cas9 system um, and <clears throat> It's actually found in bacteria. Bacteria will actually use the CRISPR-Cas9 system to cleave 
to cut viral DNA, okay? Because viruses can infect bacteria. So they have like, they have restriction enzymes to cut viral DNA. They have the CRISPR, um, they, they have the CRISPR um, Cas9 to, you know, get rid of viral DNA. But we are able to utilize the CRISPR Cas9 for our own purpose, okay? So this is what the, the CRISPR Cas9 consists of. It consists of um, the, um, the Cas9 enzyme. So this gray thing is a, an enzyme. And then within the enzyme is this little short RNA sequence. And we call that short RNA sequence the gRNA or guide RNA. And that RNA, we can actually um, produce. We can um, produce an RNA sequence to, um, to target a specific gene. Okay, so you know we have, we have sequenced human genome, so we can actually target genes. Maybe it's a genetic disorder, disorder that we want to target. And so we can create, we can create an RNA sequence that is complementary to the DNA gene that we want to maybe cut, okay? So the Cas9, and I feel like this picture isn't the best, but the Cas9, CRISPR-Cas9 system consists of an enzyme that cuts DNA. Okay, so the Cas9 enzyme cuts DNA, but then the guide RNA is complementary to the gene that we are targeting. Okay, so the CRISPR-Cas9 system consists of two things, an enzyme that cuts DNA, and then the guide RNA that is complementary to the gene that we're targeting. And it can cut the gene maybe for a knockout. Okay, actually the CRISPR-Cas9 was first used and is con it's still being used to knock out genes. If we can get it to cut the gene, it's going to uh, damage the DNA. And once it dam damages the DNA, um, there's going to be you know enzymes that are repairing. And oftentimes when they repair uh, cut DNA like this, they make mistakes, okay, they make mistakes. And so there's gonna be, there's gonna be a mutation. And if there's a mutation in the gene, it's gonna knock out that gene, making that gene useless, okay? That gene is no longer gonna be functional. It's not gonna be able to make a functional protein. It's useless. So we can knock out the gene. So if we can have, you know, if we can knock out genetic disorders, you know, that might, solve a lot of problems okay so that's our hope is that we can use the crispr cas9 to target genes for genetic disorders knock them out or maybe we can target these genetic disorder genes and cut them out and then insert the correct gene maybe we can do that okay so the crispr cas9 system is very um you know a lot of laboratories are using it right now to uh genetically you know, manipulate and get rid of, you know, genetic disorders and maybe put in, insert correct genes, okay, genes that are, um, that are normal functioning, that code for normal functioning proteins. Um, actually, a couple of years ago, there was a scientist in, in China who actually did use the CRISPR-Cas9 to genetically modify um, a baby. Um, and, you know, they didn't do any, he didn't do anything crazy. He just basically genetically modified a protein um, that um, would cause or allow, I should say, a protein that would allow for HIV to um, be transmitted and be, you know, infect that host. So they, he basically he created a child um, actually with that. And it was a lot of like controversy because he actually genetically modified the embryo. It was uh, an IVF embryo without the consent of the parents. So that was, that was why it was so controversial. But he basically created the, um, a baby that is immune that could not get HIV because he knocked out that protein, the protein that would allow for HIV to enter the, the host cell, okay? Sorry, I'm getting sidetracked here. The last, or actually not the last thing, but the next thing we're gonna talk about is farm animals, okay? Farm animals, and it's called farm animals. It's like a play on words, like, you know, animal farm, right, farm, but then also pharmaceuticals, right? We can have, we can have animals 
have um, proteins in them that don't normally belong, have genes in them that normally do not belong in them. So we can create transgenic animals. Transgenic animals are made by introducing genes from one species into the gene of another animal, the genome of another animal. So they can serve as factories to make proteins. I did, ta did talk about these guys before. These are the spider goats, right? These spider goats contain, um, these, these goats contain spider, a spider gene in them. So when um, they produce milk, the milk contains proteins for the silk, the spider silk. Um, and, you know, spider silk is very strong, right? They say that, um, you know, spider silk is stronger than steel, right? If you take a certain amount of spider silk and steel of the same mass, the same mass or same density, I think it is, um, the spider silk is much more stronger. It's stronger than steel, okay? So the reason why we, scientists produce spider goats is that if, our, the spider is, if the goat is able to produce spider protein, if we can purify it out of the milk, then we can use that protein to make really strong fabrics. Um, it can be used in textiles. It can be used uh, in maybe military use. You know, it's a very strong um, protein. In this video, we're not going to see, but it has to do with the spider goats. Oh, that is the last thing. Okay. So, guys, that was a really long video, but we finished. Um, and I did provide notes in Schoology, so hopefully um, you guys were taking notes. Anyways, that was a really long one, and I hope that it was helpful, that it wasn't too confusing. Okay. All right, guys. Have a good day. Bye.